Now let's continue on in Revelation 20 and let's ask some questions. It says, the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. Then we have the the great white throne judgment, it is called, in verse 12. And then, uh, verse 11 rather. Then verse 12, we find that John saw the dead, small and great standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Now then, these dead are those, all those not in the first resurrection, and as we will see, those who had not committed the unpardonable sin. Now, let's come back here to 1 John, the fifth chapter, and let's understand something very important concerning sin. And then we will look at what happens to those who are raised from the dead. So there are sins that we commit that are forgivable. Now those who were not called of God, who have committed sins that are not the unpardonable sin, never had an opportunity for their sins to be forgiven, nor did they have an opportunity to repent of them. So let's see what it says about sin here in 1 John, the 5th chapter, and verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin that is not unto death, he shall ask, and he will give him life for those who, who do not sin a sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. Now that is the second death he's talking about here. Concerning that sin, I do not say that he should make any supplication to God. Now, let's see how Paul defines the unpardonable sin. Now, let's come back here to Hebrews, book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Now, we are going to see that the unpardonable sin is going to result in the second death. That is... An unforgivable sin or unforgivable sins that they become totally hostile, they reject God, they reject salvation. Now, there can be those who absolutely know better. There may be a few who have committed the unpardonable sin not having been converted. But those will be few indeed. Now let's see what the unpardonable sin is. Beginning here in verse 26. For if we willful, willfully go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, so these are the ones who received the knowledge of the truth, were converted and turn their backs on God, and reject God, reject the Holy Spirit, reject all the things that God had provided for them. There is no longer any sacrifice for sins, but a certain terrifying expectation of inevitable judgment of a fierce fire which will devour the adversaries of God. Now, Paul brings out a very important point here in verse 28. Consider this. Anyone who rejects the law of Moses dies without mercy under the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
of how much worse punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified as an unholy thing and has scorned the spirit of grace. Now that is almost an undescribably evil sin, but there are going to be those who do so because there is free moral agency and we must choose. Without a doubt, we Now let's come back to Hebrews 6 chapter because Paul also describes it here. And it shows the willful rejection of the truth of God once their eyes have been opened, once they have known, once they have understood. Now those who have been blinded, any sin short of the unpardonable sin is forgivable. Now we'll see that here in just a bit. But here is what Paul says, verse 4, Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 and verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and who have personally obtained the the heavenly gift and became partakers of the Holy Spirit, and that heavenly gift is the forgiveness of sin, and became partakers of the Holy Spirit, and who have tasted the good word of God, they come to understand it, to live by it, and the powers of the world to come, understanding the plan of God, if, verse 6, they have fallen away to renew them again to repentance. Now, to fall away or apostatize and leave God. Now, there have been many heinous and terrible sins. Murder is a forgivable sin. Abortion is a forgivable sin. All of those done in ignorance, all of those done being blinded. Now, did God blind ancient Israel? Yes, he did. And God never gave them even those even those who live fairly decent lives God never gave them an opportunity for salvation. Now let's come back to the chapter here in Ezekiel 37, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Ezekiel 37. However, let's understand this, that you cannot understand the timing of when this will take place or understand what it really means in Ezekiel 37, unless you understand the book of Revelation and the scriptures that we just covered, the rest of the dead. Because, you see, those who are dead in Christ will be raised first. That's the first resurrection. They will rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, and Satan is again put away, then the rest of the dead live again. And this is the great army that stands before the great white throne judgment. Now, all of these people have lived a life in the flesh once, but never had an opportunity for salvation. Ancient Israel didn't. Oh yes, the patriarchs did. Moses did. Samuel did. Certain of the kings like David and Hezekiah. Then before the flood, you have Abel and you have Enoch and you have Noah. After the flood, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what about the rest of Israel? as we read on one of these days, that God did not give it to the children of Israel to have eyes to see and ears to hear. 
Now, a lot of them, even though they lived what we would call upright lives, like a lot of people in the world today and down through history, they've lived decent lives. They've been honest. They've tried to do what was right, but God never called them. They never received the Holy Spirit of God. Now God is going to give them an opportunity for salvation. And we find that described here as the details of the second resurrection. Now, we have the first resurrection, then in Revelation 20, we have the second resurrection. And as we will see, there are two parts to the second resurrection. Those who have not sinned to sin unto death, and those who have sinned the sin unto death. Now we're going to see it begins first with Israel, and then we will see it will be with the other nations of the world too. Just like we have in Revelation 7. The 144,000 from the children of Israel, and then the great innumerable multitude, are all granted salvation. Those are the workers of the last hour, the eleventh hour. Now here in Ezekiel 37, we have something that could not be understood without Revelation 20. And we also have something here that is very interesting because this is not a resurrection to spiritual life, but to physical life. So let's read it, beginning in verse 1. The hand of the Lord was on me and brought me by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. Now, these are human bones. And if you have bones, that shows that there was life and death. And he made me walk among them all around, and behold, very many were in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry, showing time had taken place. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Well, he couldn't tell. Okay. And he said again to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will lay send you upon you, and will bring flesh up on you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. See, they didn't know the Lord in their first life. That's a key important thing. So it's a resurrection to a second physical life for the purpose of having an opportunity for salvation. Let's go on. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And as I watched, behold, the sinew and flesh came up on them, and skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. And of course, a second physical. Now we will see even right here that we can discern that they are given an opportunity for salvation. Let's read on. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, 
an exceeding great army. Very similar to Revelation 20, right? I saw the dead standing before the throne, the great white throne. These came up, stood on their feet. All right. An exceeding great army, like it said back there in Revelation 20, there were so many that there was no place found for them. Verse 11, the key. God identifies who they are. And he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. That's who they are. And we'll see in just a little bit. The Bible principle is to Israel first, then to the rest of the nations. That's why in Revelation 7, the 144,000 first, then the great innumerable multitude from many nations and languages and kindreds and tongues and so forth. Okay? These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and we are, ourselves are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves dead once and cause you to come up out of your graves to live a second life in the flesh and will give, bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now what is the thing concerning salvation? that we know God, we know his commandments, we know his love, we have his spirit, right? Yes. Well, they didn't know God, even though they were the children of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and have brought you up out of your graves. It says it four times. Graves. And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. That is conversion. An opportunity now, because you see, it talks about the books were open, and then the book of life was open, we'll see back in Revelation 20. And this means an opportunity for salvation. Now they have an opportunity for salvation to have their names written in the book of life. See, because if God blinds them, he's responsible to give them an opportunity for salvation because that is his desire. And if they die without that taking place, God says he still wants all those to be saved. But how can they be saved if they have died before they have had an opportunity for salvation? They can't be. So God is going to correct that. God is going to fulfill his word. God is going to give them life. God is going to give them an opportunity for salvation. A lot of those who don't understand that say, well, this is a second chance. No, it's a second physical life to receive salvation. Just like we pointed out earlier concerning Lazarus, he was raised from the dead so he could be converted on the day of Pentecost and receive eternal life, being in the first resurrection. Now then, here are those who died and were not raised. Here is their chance for salvation. Let's read it. Okay? Yes. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and have done it, says the Lord. Now let's come back to Matthew, the 12th chapter again, and let's see where Jesus refers to this. This then gives us understanding not only of Israel, but gives us understanding concerning the other nations. So let's read it. Verse 31. 
Because of this I say to you, every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, except the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that shall not be forgiven to men. And whoever speaks against a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this age nor in the coming age. So you see what this is talking about. Only one opportunity for salvation if you lived and died without that opportunity, you will be raised back to life and be given an opportunity to repent and have those sins forgiven. Now, if you have been called, received the Holy Spirit of God, or if God has dealt directly, and this applies to a few who reject God, who reject the Holy Spirit of God, and who have committed the unpardonable sin, which may include those like the beast and the false prophet. They'll never repent, see? And they will never receive forgiveness. See? Shall not be forgiven neither in this age nor in the coming age. Now let's come down here to verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we desire to see a sign from you. And he answered and said to them, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign shall be given it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, in the same manner the Son of Man shall be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh shall stand up. That means be resurrected. And he's talking about those that repented when Noah preached. Not Noah, but Jonah preached rather. Okay? The men of Nineveh shall stand up in the judgment, and that's what we are talking about, the great white throne judgment. People are raised to judgment for an opportunity for salvation, or raised in judgment for the second death because they have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit of God. Now notice, the men of Nineveh, shall stand up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and behold a greater than Jonah is here. The king of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and rise up means to be resurrected because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now let's look at this and think about this. Even though they repented, they didn't receive eternal life. Even though the queen of the south came up and heard everything from Solomon, she didn't receive eternal life. They knew of the word of God, to whatever extent they may have had it. But they were never given an opportunity for salvation. So here is a, a, the good example showing us that this second resurrection, we've seen it in Revelation 20, the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years are finished. We have seen it in Ezekiel 37 that this is the whole house of Israel. We have seen it right here in Matthew 12 that the men of Jonah and the queen of the south then is a type which applies to all nations of the world. They will all be raised back to a second physical life 
to have an opportunity for salvation. And this is where Isaiah 65 comes in again. All right? So let's go back to Isaiah 65. They're going to have a tremendous opportunity when that happens. You see, because in the last generation, in the last generation of the millennium, the whole earth is going to be prepared for the resurrection of all the rest of these people. Where are they going to live? What are they going to wear? Where are the clothes going to come from? <laughs> all of this sort of thing. So who knows what a great and fantastic thing that is going to be. But here, Isaiah 65 and let's pick it up again here in verse 17 because we can apply this equally to those during the millennium as well as those who are resurrected to a second physical life after the millennium is over. So let's read it here. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth. For the former things will not be remembered nor come to mind. Yes, indeed. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and will joy in my people. Well, is God going to joy in the fact that Israel has been brought back to life? In the fact that all of those other nations have also been resurrected back for an opportunity for salvation? Yes, because God wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth, all to be saved, all to repent. And so if they haven't had an opportunity to do it in this life because they were blinded or because they were born before Jesus' time or because they never received the word of God, never understood any of these things, God is going to resurrect them and cause them to forget all that they've gone through, and they will repent, and they will receive salvation. Now, it will be the same thing. Verse 20. And there will not be an infant who does not, who lives but a few days. Think of this. All of those babies that died be resurrected. And I personally believe all of those who have been aborted will also be resurrected because there will be plenty of mothers willing to receive the children that they had aborted because that is a forgivable sin. And God is going to say here, is your child that you never had an opportunity to enjoy. And I think God is going to raise them the equivalent of full-term birth. Now, what a joy that is going to be. What a fantastic thing to undo every evil under the sun. All the heinous burning of those six million Jews, all overturned and forgiven. All of those who have been killed by dictators, whether it be in Russia or China or Southeast Asia or North or South America or Africa, any place in the world, all of those who died those untimely deaths will all be raised and given a life to live and have an opportunity to know God, to receive salvation. Now that's something. For the child will die a hundred years old. At that time, they'll, they will be changed from flesh to spirit if they are ready to enter into eternal life. But the sinner who is a hundred years old shall be a curse. Now that applies to the to the millennium, because the incorrigible sinners will all be resurrected. We'll see that here in just a minute and see that even one of the Psalms talks about that very thing. Now, let's come back to Revelation 20 again. So this is the great news, brethren. 
This is the good news of God's salvation for the whole world. God is responsible. God will take care of it. God will give them an opportunity for salvation that they will live forever. Now, let's come back here and see this. Revelation 20. Okay? Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who was sitting on it. Judgment was given to Christ for every one from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead. That is all the rest of the dead. Small and great. Standing before God and the books were open. They're going to have their minds open to the word of God. The blindness is going to be removed. The hard-heartedness is going to be removed. And there are going to be tears of repentance and joy, thanksgiving and greatness to God because he has done this. And we're going to have an opportunity to help them. We are going to be there and help carry this out. Think about that. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Well, their names were not written in the book of life for eternal salvation, for their first life. Now, God probably has a section in the book of life for those who will be raised back to the, to the second resurrection, separate from those in the first resurrection. So now here, their names will be entered in the book of life. And it'll be entered in there when they come to themselves, repent of their sins, see what they have done in their first life, ask God to blot out their sins, take away the memory of it, receive the Holy Spirit of God, have a chance to walk in grace and knowledge and truth, live a hundred years and practice the way of God. What a fantastic thing that is going to be. Now, if only more atheists would understand that, there wouldn't be hardly any atheist at all because they look at all the silly religions of men and say properly, how can that be of God? This is of God right here. And the ju dead were judged out of the things written in the books. Okay? Judged according to the word of God, just like us according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and the grave gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged individually according to their works. Now then, at the end of the 100-year period, there has to be two things that take place. Number one, if any of those raised back to a second life reject salvation, they'll go into the lake of fire. Be their second death. Okay? Number two, all of those who lived and died and were dead and buried who have committed the unpardonable sin, they will be raised back to a second life in the flesh with all the wicked together to be cast into the lake of fire and burned up. And their memory, no more, will be. So what God is going to do is this. And death and the grave were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. If anyone was not found written in the book of life, he is cast into the lake of fire. Now remember, Paul said that if the unpardonable sin is committed, look forward to the fiery judgment of God. Now let's come back to the book of Psalms and see one scripture. Psalm 37 and verse 38. And this talks about how all the wicked will be judged together. 
Psalm 37 and verse 38. Now notice this, verse 38. But the sinners shall be destroyed together. That is the second death. Now after that, then begins the great work of God for all eternity. So let's come back to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And let's see how fantastic this is going to be. Let's understand that God is going to remove all evidence of sin and things physical on this earth. He is going to burn it up. That's what Peter talks about in Second Peter, the third chapter. This earth and the heavens around it are going to be burned up and all the elements will melt with a fierce heat. And that is to prepare the earth for the coming new Jerusalem. So, Revelation 21 and verse 1. So after this then, John writes, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, spirit beings do not need to have the temperature modulated by having oceans. God will take care of that a different way with spirit beings. Okay? And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of Heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from heaven say, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and that is with men and women made perfect. Spirit being. Because no one can dwell in the presence of God in the flesh. No one can look upon the face of God in the flesh. Because the power from God just from his very being, would consume all that flesh. And he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now think of what a fantastic and wonderful time that is. That's why those of us who have the Holy Spirit now are called the children of God. And at that time, we will be fully developed spirit beings with God, with Jesus Christ. And he is going to present to his family grown great, new Jerusalem. And all of those in the first resurrection will live in new Jerusalem and the earth will be occupied by all of those who were saved on the rest of the new earth. So it's going to be a fantastic time. It's going to be beyond what our minds can comprehend. We can have a glimpse of it, a shadow of it, an understanding of it through what is written here. But God is going to heal every wound, cure everything that has gone wrong with mankind. Verse 4, And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, neither shall there be any more pain because the former things have passed away. They are gone. They're all burned up. The new earth is fit now for the spirit sons and daughters and all of those who are saved from the nations so that we can now partake in the rest of God's plan for all eternity. Let's read it here. Verse 5. 
And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Then he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the one who thirsts, I will give freely of the water. Uh, I will give freely of the fountain of the water of life. The one who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and fornicators and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the angels came and showed John. Now imagine this, John receiving this vision. And he showed him New Jerusalem, fantastic, made of spiritual things that can only be equated to precious stones and silver and gold and all of those things the just shine and sparkle. Now then he showed something else here too. Verse 22, And I saw no temple in it. Completion of God's plan. He's going to live with his people. And they will worship him directly, not through a temple or a tabernacle. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon that they shine on it. No, it'll still be there to tell us time. Because the glory of God enlightens it, and the light of it is the Lamb. And the nations that are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. So however life is going to be as spirit beings, it is going to be active and busy and tremendous and wonderful to beyond anything that we can fathom. We have these words to give us encouragement. We have these things to tell us, to inspire us. We have these words to lead us to repent of the sin so that we don't sin. Now, continuing on, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing that defiles shall ever enter into it. No more sin nor shall anyone who practices an abomination or devises a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So then he sees the throne of God. And imagine what that is going to be like. The throne of God and the throne of the Lamb, and out from the throne, flowing from the throne, is the water of life, clear, as crystal, always the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's why this last great day starts out with the water of the ceremony around the altar of God. Verse 2, And in the middle of the street and on this side and on that side of the river was the tree of life, producing twelve manner of fruits, each month yielding its fruit, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And that, me that means maintenance or, or the perpetuation of eternal life for us, and that also means to be learning more and more and more of God's way through all eternity. Just think, being spirit beings, living for eternity, we need a mind, a heart, a, and the abilities to go along with it, and God will give it to us. Verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name 
is in their foreheads. See, God, what is that going to be like the very first time that we come to God the Father and he calls us by our new name and we say, yes, our Holy Father, Lord God Almighty, who lives forever into the ages of eternity and your plan for your family is fantastic and great. Yes, indeed it is. Verse 5, And there shall be no night there, for they will have no need of a lamp or light of the sun, because the Lord God enlightens them, and they shall reign into the ages of eternity. And that goes clear back to the prophecy concerning the first coming of Christ and that the government will be upon his shoulders and he will sit on the throne of David his father and there will be no end. No end to the increase of his government. Think of that. Now, verse 6. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets has sent his angel to show his servants the things that must shortly come to pass. Now, how soon that will be? We don't know. But as far as God is concerned, it's going to be a blink of an eye. For us, Living in the flesh, how long that will be, we don't know. But it won't be done until the things in the book of Revelation up to this point have been fulfilled. Now he says, verse 7, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And that includes the whole Bible. And I, John, was the one who saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who was showing me these things. But he said to me, see that you do not do this. For I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. And if there is a time that it is near, we're nearer than we ever have been since the time we first began. And we don't know how long it's going to be, but it is near, especially if we calculate time the way God does. So he says, verse 11. Let the one that is today. Now we come back down today. Verse 10. And verse 11 says, Let the one who is unrighteous be unrighteous still. Let the one who is filthy be filthy still. Let the one who is righteous be righteous still. And let the one who is holy be holy still. Behold, I am coming and my reward is with me to render to each one according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who keep his commandments, that they may have the right to eat of the tree of life and may enter by the gate into the city, but excluded left out because you see you can't be evil and have the blessings of God you can't be evil and receive eternal life that's the message here verse 15 but excluded are dogs and sorcerers and fornicators and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and devises a lie so no one is going to enter into the kingdom of God who does not repent of their sins I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify these things to you 
in the churches. Isn't that profound? Yes, that the churches of God are to know these things, not the world. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And this is what we are going to do all during the millennium and all during the great white throne judgment period of a hundred years. Come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who thirsts, come. And let the one who desires to partake of the water of life freely. Now we're left with this after all that inspiration and all those fantastic words of God. We have to leave the feast. We have to go back to our homes. And we have to face the things in the world. So he gives us some encouragement here. Verse 18. For I jointly testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book that if anyone adds to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come. Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And brethren, so closes the festival season for 2013. May God's blessing be upon you in every way.